Welcome everyone. My name is Alexa and I'll be your host today. Thanks for joining us for Agile Transformation Best Practices with Jeff Payne and Mike Sowers. First, I would like to go over some features in Adobe Connect that you can use during today's web seminar. If you have not done so already, you can download a copy of the seminar materials from the resources section on the right side of your screen. By default, all comments posted in chat are visible to everyone. However, if you experience any sort of technical difficulty and need assistance, please send me a private chat message. To do so, in the upper right-hand corner of the chat panel, select Start Chat With, and then my name, Alexa Angel. Enter your message, and I'll be able to help you immediately. You can also use the status menu, which is located next to the main menu navigation at the top of your screen, to show agreement, ask the speaker to speak louder, or share some applause. Hey, Jeff and Mike, we're ready for you. Awesome. Good day, everybody. So just to introduce ourselves before we begin, my name is Jeff Payne. I'm the co-host for this webinar. Uh, I've been building and testing software for many decades now. Too long to, to comment on. Uh, ran a couple of software companies, including Covaris, that we'll talk a little bit about in a minute. I'm also the technical editor for the Agile Connection community. If you're not familiar with Agile Connection, it's a free connection and community of Agile and DevOps professionals. If you go to agileconnection.com, you can uh, join in the conversation. And every week we publish fresh content in terms of blogs and interviews and other things on Agile Connection for the community. And, uh, Please join if you're interested in that. Also, follow me on Twitter, at Jeffrey E. Payne. I tweet a lot on Agile, DevOps, test, test automation, integrating security into all those things, and all sorts of other fun software topics. Mike, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Thanks for joining us today. We're excited to have you here and talk about Agile best practices. Uh, I've got about uh, three decades in the IT and software engineering and test industry. Uh, actually started my journey as a co-op student right out of college and then uh, uh, took on various roles. Uh, one of my most uh, challenging but rewarding roles with, was, was with a uh, large financial institution uh, where we actually moved from Waterfall to uh, Agile. So I want to share a little bit about that experience today. Uh, at Coveros, I've got a couple hats. So one is I'm our line of business leader for our training uh, organization, and we offer about 60 uh, different uh, trainings to support our uh, consulting <coughs> engagements and uh, transformation in, in Agile and DevOps. And uh, also I'm the program chair for our STAR uh, software testing conferences. So anyone that's interested in uh, speaking at a conference would love to uh, talk with you and have you submit a, a proposed paper. Jeff, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Mike. So that's a little bit about Mike and I. We thought we'd find out a little bit about everyone in the audience here. So I'm going to open up, open up a poll here. And uh, please What's, tell us what your role is. Pick the one that most represents. I understand people play you know, many roles, many hats. If you don't see one that fits you, just put other and just put your role in the, the chat box so we know who else is on here that's not, uh, that doesn't have a uh, radio button. Give you a few minutes to do that and then we'll publish the results and see, see who's on the, uh, on the line. See, we've got a bunch of people in chat. We've got uh, test, head of projects, agile coach, quality manager, agile team member, development, funny uh, community, very good, software quality assurance auditor, business analyst, awesome. Lots of good, uh, lots of good folks in there. All right, why don't we go ahead and uh, let's let's broadcast the results and and look at this. Um, so we've got. Uh, We've got 28 and other, although some of them that posted in there, I think we do have a category for. We have a test category for some. Mm -hmm. uh, but if we look at the other ones, what do you think about this, Mike? It looks like we're split kind of 50-50 between management, scrum master, and test. Does that surprise yeah. you? What, what do you think about that? No, I think it's a really great uh, 
diverse set of, uh, of people. Uh, I don't see any operations or security team members uh, represented. Uh, Everybody's uh, saying, fancy that. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Fancy Talk that. Talk a little bit about that later, right? Yeah, exactly, right. Yeah, no, good. Great, great diverse uh, group. Thank you, everybody, for, for doing that. So as Mike mentioned and I mentioned, uh, we work at Coveris. And just to give you some context, Coveris started in 2008. And all we do is Agile and DevOps. So we have a lot of experience with Agile transformations and helping companies. And we've learned a lot about what works. We've also learned a lot about what the challenges are and what doesn't work. And that's the purpose of this webinar is to share some of those lessons learned. You get my experience from some transformations I've done. You'll get Mike's experience. And uh, we'll give you plenty of time to ask questions at the end um, and, and pick our brains about some of the challenges that you might be having in your organization. One thing I wanted to highlight before we get into the best practices and, and talk a little bit about challenges is the process itself. Uh, and um, what we found is that in general, any kind of change process looks like the diagram we have here, right? Usually you start with some sort of assessment or reflection on your current state and kind of what you do well and what you don't do well. Um, and out of that, you should build yourself a plan, you know, some sort of a roadmap or um, transformation backlog, as we call it at Coveris, to help you think through, where do I go from here? How do I improve what I'm trying to do? And how do I make, in this instance, Agile better in my organization? And after we've developed a plan and come up with a roadmap for where and how we might want to improve, the next thing to do is to test that plan, right? We like to test. And that means building out some of the processes and practices that we feel like we need to do um, for the first time or to do better, put in place some tooling and train some of our folks, but really try to apply that in a particular place. We call that a pilot project or a pilot initiative, and we'll talk more about pilots later. Um, and that's where we really experiment and make sure that the things we came up with in our plan make sense for the organization to do and we can show some value or ROI in that process. Once we've verified that that's the case and the things we came up with and we've tried, we know are working, we want to scale that across the entire organization. Roll it out enterprise-wide, train people, um, and perhaps even you know, use a scaling model. We'll talk a little bit about scaling uh, in a bit. And roll it out across the organization. Of course, there's a loop in here because a lot of times we're doing this iteratively. You know, it is agile after all. We don't want to big bang our agile transformation. But we want to iteratively improve what we do, measure how we're doing, apply it somewhere, scale it, see how it's working, reassess where we're at, and keep going. Uh, any comments on that, Mike? Anything you can think of or add to that process? Well, I was thinking as you were going through that, you've probably been on both sides of this coin as well, like like I have, and that is that uh, you know we've worked in organizations that where where we've had to actually develop uh, an assessment framework, uh, or we've had to hire somebody to help us uh, with the assessment, uh, or maybe hire a full time person that is skilled in uh, doing assessments. So there's various ways to approach this. Uh, this whole uh, assessment piece and get your plan in place. And I know some of the questions that I often get asked is, you know, what, what, what's an assessment about anyway? I mean, I mean, what, what would I look for? Uh, and some of the things I think about there is, well, you know, how is it that we define the products and the, uh, and the features? Uh, you know, uh, how are we doing it to creating ep epics, uh, stories? Uh, what about our acceptance criteria? Uh, another dimension to think about in your assessment, if you're, you know, developing a, an assessment model, say in-house, is what about uh, enterprise alignment? Uh, your your demand management, or your, you know, is your work in progress uh, uh, limited in some way? Uh, what about engineering? You know, do we have collective ownership of of code? What about continuous integration? Uh, what about the planning and coordination aspects? of my methodologies from an agile perspective and what about uh, organizational uh, enablement uh, you know eliminating and managing risk uh, empowering teams and uh, and so forth 
Uh, so quite often I get these questions about, you know, what is an assessment? And uh, hopefully some of those categories can help people on the phone understand uh, the depth, depth of the assessment uh, model that they need to have in place to assess their capabilities. Yep, yeah, and it ought to be across people, right? Skills, it ought to be process, you know, what we do and how we do what we do, roles and responsibilities, uh, tool, tooling and automation. I mean, there's a lot of aspects to that assessment and that plan that we need to make sure we're all in sync if we're gonna be successful. Exactly. Yeah, and I yeah, think so, it starts, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I think it starts, you know, kind of at the top, and I know you're gonna talk about that next, from a, a, a coach training and senior leadership perspective. Yep, absolutely. So we are curious where everyone on the phone is at in their, in their DevOps or their Agile journey. Um, why don't we open a new poll? And uh, this one is, where are you in your transformation process? Are you just getting started? Do you have a plan in place and you're building out capability? Are you scaling? Um, uh, we're not this organized. <laughs> we don't have such a thing. <laughs> Uh, such a plan or a process or uh, really at this point agile is just a slogan it's not really something serious but people talk about it where are you at in this uh, on the on this particular poll All right, I'm going to broadcast the results here so interesting mm -hmm. pretty big cross-section Mike I mean we've got right, people yeah. at all levels or in all uh, um, aspects of their transformation process. They're in all categories. Well, kind of the fun one is, you know, we're not disorganized. <laughs> That's kind of a fun one. But uh, to your point, there's a widespread between just getting started and then scaling, you know, uh, agile within the organization. Yeah, and, and the not, we are not disorganized thing actually we run into that very often. Uh, so those of you that are on the phone that are in this bucket, don't feel bad. You know, it, it often is the case that um, in our organizations, unfortunately, we start initiatives without a real plan in place and without thinking it through. Um, and somebody up, you know, above comes up with an idea and they throw it over the wall or, or it trickles down to people who are asked to execute on this thing. And there's really no context for how to do that. So that is not atypical from what yeah. we see. And if you add those two together, you know, we're almost 20% uh, there between Agile is only a slogan and we're just mm -hmm. not this organized, which are essentially very, very closely related. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we're really at like 25 each in terms of, uh, you know, where, where we are in this process and or we're not in this process, right? Yeah. And yeah, now that's interesting stuff. Thanks everybody for doing that. So let's jump into some of the best practices we've found. And obviously, in a webinar, we're not going to be able to go through every best practice on the planet. But if, um, but if you get one thing out of this that helps you, we're going to be happy. And we're always available for additional conversation. Uh, the first best practice, and this is mine, I'm going to cover this one, is um, coaching and training senior leadership. So we often talk about coaching and training our teams and our scrum masters and our product owners and you know, other people. But you don't often hear people talk about getting our senior leadership coached and trained on Agile. And in my opinion, they need it more um, than our teams often do. Uh, because leading Agile, an Agile organization is much different than leading a traditional, classical, kind of command and control or dictatorial organization, right? And the leadership needs training and guidance on what an agile culture is and how teams work collectively, uh, how to lead in an agile way, how management works in agile, right? I didn't put roles and responsibilities on this slide, but certainly defining and describing roles and responsibilities is something that has to be done and unfortunately is often not well done. Um, but it's not just training, you have to do coaching. Right? You have to make sure you reinforce these lessons because any kind of change for anybody is always different and it's really easy to lapse back to the way we've always done things if, if it isn't reinforced. We obviously, we mentioned, you know, kind of uh, seeking what I call the hashtag Agile or hashtag DevOps campaign where it's really just a slogan or a, or a hashtag, but there's really no meat behind it. There's no plan behind it. 
um, we're trying to avoid that. The other thing that coaching and training senior leadership does is it provides what I call air cover. And that means that as you start to dig in and really make hard decisions around how to do Agile effectively, there's going to be people in the organization that don't want to change. And particular groups that might feel like they're losing power or you know, they're not gaining um, power in this process and they're going to push back. And if senior management isn't firm, and on board and understands what Agile is and is not and stands up for the transformation and, and the team, you know, helping move this transformation forward, unfortunately, your transformation will usually stall, uh, if not completely die. Any thoughts on that, Mike, on, on this best practice? No, I, had, I think you nailed it right, uh, right on the head. I know when we work with teams, uh, this is one of the things that we often find. Um, you know, our goal in for those of us that are our leaders is to empower those that are closest to the work. That's what Agile is all about. We're trying to build autonomous teams, you know, let the smart people uh, do smart, smart things. Uh, uh, what I found personally uh, is this often requires self-reflection and, you know, kind of change of self first. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you you said, hey, senior leader, senior leaders can say, you know, agile, but they continue at, to act in a uh, command and control, you know, kind of uh, nature. Uh, I will tell you that I was one of those actually uh, at a at an EDA uh, electronic design automation uh, company that I worked on. I worked at it on the uh, West Coast. Uh, we did electric electrical CAD uh, for software that was used by electrical engineers to produce things like uh, computer chips and uh, printed circuit boards. And uh, that was one of my first uh, agile transformations. And I knew uh, after a little personal reflection that uh, command and control is what had worked for me most of my uh, career. And so I actually went out and hired an agile leadership coach uh, for myself, mm. uh, really to help me with my blind spots. And uh, at that time, I actually had many blind spots. Uh, but as you know, Jeff, as, as we work uh, with organizations and help them uh, get through the knot holes of some of their transformation activities, quite often we run up against uh, senior leaders saying, yes, definitely support, want to embrace agile, but then are still behaving in a command and control manner. Yep, no, sure do. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, over time, lesson learned here for us is we insist upon leadership going through training and being engaged and involved in the process and getting some coaching as part of a transformation. Or we're, we're really not interested in doing it because we know it's not going to be successful. And we don't like to invest in things that aren't going to be successful. Mike, you want to take the next one? Yeah, sure. Uh, this one's all about uh, just uh, building on what Jeff said around senior leadership. Uh, then what we need to do is just ensure that everyone is engaged. Uh, I kind of like this graphic as I think it, it depicts at least two outcomes of change, which many of you maybe in the virtual room have experienced. You know, There are those that embrace and uh, champion change. Uh, that's kind of the guy in the middle holding up the uh, change uh, sign. And then, of course, there are those that are rolled over by change. Uh, those are the guys or gals that are kind of flat, right? Uh, but the one thing this graphic doesn't depict is those that may be left out of uh, the transformation. Uh, and, you know, at the risk of, of sounding like this is, uh, you know, uh, confession of Mike's mistakes, you know, uh, you know, another early mistake I made uh, and was a part of at a large financial institution uh, that that I worked at was initially leaving out the business uh, units in our agile transformation. Where we were at a company that was really an IT driven company, and the IT organization uh, was the one that sort of made things happen and 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 really drove and delivered things. Uh, from a business perspective, we were more IT-centric versus business-centric. 
Uh, and what happened is we we progressed down that path for about three to six, six months and then discovered that the business and the business units weren't part of the of the conversation. And essentially that caused us to regress. We actually had to take a step back. Uh, we had to make sure that we had identified all the key stakeholders. And essentially we started restarted our journey over again to ensure that all those key roles uh, were engaged. And usually when we think about, uh, you know, sort of the everybody, you know, engaging everybody in helping to plan and define our mission and vision and, and transformation roadmap, there, there are primary stakeholders, you know, there's secondary stakeholders, there's, uh, there's a tertiary stakeholders. And many of you in the, in the virtual room have seen these things called the racy diagrams, you know, where we, where we look to create and understand those that are responsible versus accountable versus those that we consult with or those that we just need uh, to uh, keep informed. Uh, but from a tertiary perspective, uh, we don't want to forget about people like the governance team, uh, the IT team, you know, uh, sales, uh, HR, and so forth. And then I've listed here many of the other roles that need to be engaged right up front as we begin to even plan the assessment activities, understand the gaps that are coming out of those assessment activities, and then the roadmap to address those gaps. Uh, Jeff, any other other thoughts on that? Have you had any experiences like I had where, uh, you know, kind of false starts? Yeah, most definitely. And the thing that jumps out at me looking at this, Mike, is um, all the different roles involved, right? And, um, you know, one of the things we always tell senior executives when we're working with them is that Agile doesn't have boundaries, right? You can't put Agile in a box and say, well, I just want you to work with these two groups. Um, don't talk to those people over there or those people over there. That's not the way Agile works. And, and you know, we could debate all day, is Agile and DevOps, are they now the same thing? Or are they not? Or have they combined? Because, you know, a lot of these roles that you show here aren't things that traditionally people in Agile talked about being involved in the process. But my experience was everybody's involved. As soon as you start to do anything that impacts how you work with customers, and how you get work done. And when you're relying on other groups, you're relying on their process, everybody gets pulled into Agile, whether you like it or not. We had a transformation that we were doing many years ago where, um, you know, in hindsight, uh, we did not do a good job of getting senior leadership on board before we started. And we started meeting with people and interviewing them and talking to them. And very quickly, we got a call from a senior leader who had already gotten a complaint from somebody who didn't like how far reaching we were being in our questioning. And we had only been there like three hours. <laughs> and so, you know, somebody was already saying, what are you doing? You know, this, you're supposed to be working with those software people. Why are you talking to my business people or whatever it was? And um, yeah, everyone has to be engaged. Whether they want to or not, you're going to be, to be successful. You're, you're going to have to engage everyone. Yeah, my, my quick story on that is uh, I was doing a, an assessment once and I actually asked to talk to the HR team member and they looked at me like I had two or three heads, you know, it's like, well, why would you ever want to talk to the HR people? <laughs> right? you because, you know, we're all about agile, right? That's right. So the third best practice is focusing on culture first. I would argue that probably 75% of the challenges that you're going to have in your agile transformation are around cultural change. People don't like to change. We know that, right? I don't like to change. Nobody likes to change. Um, many of you, I'm sure, have read the book, Who Moved My Cheese? It's been around for decades, and it's a very simple, lightweight read on change um, that really gets to the point, which is if you're going to ask people to transform, transform means change. And you're going to have to work to get the organization on board with that change and keep them on board or you're not going to be successful. Regardless of the tools you put in place or whether you're using Scrum on your teams or XP or you know, you're know you doing CI, CD, if you don't get everyone to change and understand how to work together culturally, you are not going to succeed. We were talking about roles earlier. 
you know, unfortunately, a lot of times in the transformation process, people don't define out roles, particularly for middle management. Agile changes the role of management, um, and so does DevOps. And if you're not clear about it, management's going to be confused. And when management is confused, they're going to fear the worst, and they're not going to want to change. And so you've got to figure out how to define roles and, and responsibilities clearly. And that will help remove fears by communicating what we're doing, why we're doing it, making sure people understand their role and where we're headed um, so that everybody knows that there's no fear here. We're not trying to change anything to the detriment of the organization. We're trying to make it better. Uh, the other thing we have to do, though, is make sure that we celebrate the right behavior. So when people are doing things in an agile way, it's celebrated and it's publicly celebrated. But if they're doing things that are not agile, those are privately redirected and discussed. You have to nip bad behavior in, in you know, nip it in the bud. Because if you let it fester or prosper, um, it might overtake the good behaviors. So remember to Make sure you reward the good behaviors and make sure people know what the good behaviors are and make that public to everybody, but also to make sure you make, you make it clear when someone's doing something that doesn't meet or move in the direction you want to move in. And this all gets back to, I always say, being agile versus doing agile. So many agile transformations that I see are way too focused on we're going to do Scrum, we're going to do XP, we're going to do Safe, we're going to do whatever it is, right? And it's about doing Agile instead of aligning with the Agile principles, following the principles, and making the customer successful and adding value to the customer. Mm -hmm. Mike, comments, you know, thoughts? Jeff, uh, uh, of the eight practices we picked out uh, today to, to talk about for, with the virtual room, uh, to me, this is like the most important important one. I think if, if people are going to leave with one thing from this webinar today, I hope they leave with, with this point that you made. Uh, uh, so many times I've gone into uh, organizations and, you know, it's not about the skill sets to the people. It's not about the processes. It's not about the tools. It's not about uh, the desire for, for people to do uh, and want to do the right thing. Uh, it's, 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 it's all about the fact that uh, we've missed the four values and and 12 principles or misinterpreted those from the manifesto, right? Uh, for example, things like working software over comprehensive documentation, you know, particularly say when it comes to testing. Uh, quite often that's interpreted as, well, we don't need any documentation, right? Uh, or responding to change over following a plan. Uh, well, uh, we can just change anything, you know, even in the midst of a sprint, we can rip out eight stories and put in uh, another eight stories, right, in the two or three week sprint <clears throat> that we're uh, engaged in, right? Uh, and, and I always can anchor back to the fact that, you know, uh, remember the, the, the authors of the manifesto, uh, what did they say? They said, well, you know, while there's value in the items on the right, we value the items on the left more, but that first part is always missed. There is value on the items uh, on the right of those uh, uh, values. And, and so indeed, I, I fully agree with you. You know, it, it's really about creating that culture first and embracing uh, agile from a cultural and behavioral perspective. Yep, totally agree. Mm -hmm. Take the next one. Sure, this one's uh, about uh, paved, what we call something called paved uh, paths. What's the idea of a paved path? Well, uh, these are simply just sets of, of say, guidelines or guardrails or practices, uh, methodologies, uh, techniques uh, that provide a foundational set of capabilities for an agile team or agile teams uh, to get started. And so then teams have a choice, you know, they, they can embrace this, this uh, paved path and, and build on it from a foundational perspective, or they can choose to kind of chop through the forest uh, on their own. But part of easing the transformation 
is to provide these teams what we call these paved paths. Uh, one way to, to approach creating those is we can uh, do some current state process mapping. We can look for opportunities. Uh, we can look for time wasters. Uh, we can look for e uh, excessive uh, weights and so forth in our current methodology. And then we can use uh, things like value stream mapping to re-engineer our methodologies and processes, ensure that, that uh, uh, we eliminate uh, all the wasteful steps and that every step in our methodology uh, adds uh, value. And then the next opportunity, of course, are the tools, uh, ensuring that the teams have an integrated set of uh, tools that work together right from the ideation uh, clear through to delivery and development from an integrated workflow perspective. And then finally, ensuring that the appropriate environments can be easily and repeatedly you know, spun up uh, or tor torn down as needed. And of course, in any uh, larger enterprise organization, there are different teams working on different technology stacks. And so it's possible that we need you know, more than one uh, set of paved paths, uh, say for web versus ABI, API versus embedded uh, and so forth. But, but uh, in, first of all, just engaging everyone in creating and piloting those paved paths and then making those paved paths available to the teams helps ease the transformation. Uh, you want to build on that, Jeff? Yeah, I, lo I love the concept of a paved path. So as everybody knows, in Agile, teams are supposed to be able to decide for themselves what tools they use, what processes they follow. As long as it adds value to the customer, that's the right thing to do. And that is a great philosophy. The challenge in a big organization is you get no effectiveness or efficiency when you do that. Um, and also, you don't, you, you can't aggregate tool licenses and pay for things in bulk. Um, you know, there's, there's all sorts of reasons why, you know, just letting every single team do whatever they want is often a very, not a very good business idea. But on the other hand, we can't dictate tools. And so the idea of this paid path is, well, let's create things that we think are applicable to sets of teams or organizations. Let's support it and provide it to the teams and educate and train them. If they want to use it, it's an easy paved path through the woods. If they don't, well, then they're on their own and they're going to have to chop through that woods. And I think it's a great way um, to tackle the issue of trying to allow teams to make their own decisions, but trying to also get some efficiency and effectiveness and some best practice across different teams in the organization. Um, it's a good compromise, if you will. One thing, though, that you got to be careful of is, you know, this kind of concept we're talking about starting to become um, a PMO. Mm -hmm. And so we don't have time to talk about PMOs. We could do a whole webinar on, on PMOs yeah. and Agile. <laughs> but, you know, a PMO in, in a classic traditional PMO makes sure that certain processes are followed. And we're not at, we're not forcing the teams to follow these paved paths or these practices. And, and so, you know, don't think of a paved path as, oh, this is something that I'm going to give to a PMO and they're going to like beat everybody over the head with it to make sure it gets done. That's not the intent here. What you want to create instead are centers of enablement that provide these capabilities and training and support around them to enable teams to be successful. Right. And you can begin, I mean, if you engage uh, everyone in the development of those paved paths, quite often we can uh, embed in those paved paths, you know, the appropriate uh, checkpoints, uh, guardrails, uh, governance, and so forth that everybody agrees with, yep. uh, you know, without, <clears throat> without it sounding uh, too process heavy. Yep, absolutely. So practice number five is piloting change. I mentioned in the Agile transformation process that once you've come up with the different um, concepts around your processes and your practices and your tools, things you want to improve on, uh, you should be looking to pilot those before you try to apply them everywhere. And so typically what we advocate after we've come up with a, an, a plan of attack for um, improving the organization's Agile capability is to apply those first improvements to one particular project or product 
uh, to test it out, validate it, and figure out you know, how well it works. And um, the process of doing that, you have to be able to identify a good pilot project, one that you think is going to be representative of the org, uh, but has some certain factors. And we've got this little chart down on the lower right that I like that helps teams figure out what a good pilot project might be. Um, you don't want it to be sm too small, uh, because if it's too small, people will discount it and they'll say, well, of course Agile worked on that. It wasn't, it was just a toy project, right? But you also don't want it to be too large. You're doing something for the first time. You know, size and scale equals risk. And so don't pick a massively huge project that you need to do. In terms of duration, uh, you don't want it to be a couple of weeks. That's probably not going to prove anything. And it's also not going to give you a chance to run into problems, which you'll ultimately run into when you try a new process and, and learn from those challenges and problems and figure out how to work around them. But you also don't want it so long that management loses interest because you're not showing any results. So you got to kind of find something in the middle. We find pilots that are three to six months are pretty good timeframes for pilots because you want to get yourself through a release cycle, essentially. And most people are releasing, you know, every three months, let's say, you know, plus or minus. And so you want to make sure you go through at least a full release cycle in a pilot. Uh, you don't want the application to be not important at all, because again, then everybody will go, well, that doesn't really matter. So who cares? You got Agile to work on it. Big deal. But you also don't want it to be mission critical. We actually had a transformation where the, the customer came to us with a proposed pilot that was the most important critical project in their entire company's history. And they said, we're so vested in Agile, we're betting the farm on it. Yeah. And I was like, well, that's wonderful, but don't do that in the pilot. <laughs> don't bet the farm on a pilot. So don't go for your most critical application either. You do need very strong business sponsorship, though. A critical piece of Agile, as I'm sure you all know, is working with the business side to define and understand the requirements and change those requirements as needed and drive through the process and build something of value. And without strong business sponsorship, you're not going to be successful. So make sure you've got strong business sponsorship for whatever pilot project that you, um, that you undertake. Choose your participants wisely because strategically those that are involved in the pilot, you want to make stark raving fans of, of Agile in the end. And you want them to go out and help spread the word and get involved in other projects to make other, you know, Agile successful in other places. And then don't forget to measure things. Mike's going to talk about measurement in a bit, so I won't belabor that point. But also remember, Agile is iterative. You experiment, you try things, you learn from that, you retro it, you repeat it, and you do it better. Um, so that's the process you should follow when you do pilots. Mike, anything you want to add? Uh, just want to amplify a couple of points you made. One is uh, engaging the appropriate and picking those stakeholders carefully is one way to uh, find out who your early adopters are going to be, and those are going to be your champions uh, going forward. And then the other thing that I learned the hard way was that you really need to pilot, you know, all dimensions, people, skills, process, and technology, particularly the tools. Uh, because quite often we have to modify the methodologies or the processes to take advantage of the tooling or tool capabilities. No, that's a good one. And speaking of tools, you want to cover automation? Yeah, sure. Uh, the next uh, key practice, I think this is number six, if I recall, uh, automation being the key. Uh, you know, I don't think there's any uh, automation is not really a magic bullet. It's something that's uh, necessary, but uh, not sufficient. I'm certainly not a believer that uh, uh, of the slogan, you know, let's just automate everything and uh, life will be life will be good. Uh, really here, as we're talking about agile and DevOps, we're automating now uh, from two perspectives. Uh, of course, testing is an automation uh, opportunity. Uh, thinking about driving, continuing to drive testing left, uh, looking at uh, being able to do static analysis, uh, look at the complexity of code, 
uh, evaluate the security uh, of the code and identify uh, security uh, vulnerabilities, uh, looking at your open source library uh, usage, uh, uh, ensuring that I'm following any uh, either industry or custom coding standards, uh, being able to automate uh, unit testing, integration testing, and uh, story testing, and, and so forth. And of course, that requires the right tools and the right skill sets. But of course, now the other dimension uh, that we're, uh, we need to automate uh, is the conveyor belt itself, that is the pipeline. And so how is it that uh, a developer uh, <clears throat> can make a modification uh, in a particular piece of code, uh, have that picked up by the uh, change management system, you know, such as Git, uh, do that submit, uh, do that commit, uh, submit that to some kind of a feature branch, uh, and then roll that through to an automated set of a unit test and or static analysis, get the environment set up, and then actually uh, configure the environment, configure the data and the databases, make sure it passes certain quality gates, and then deploy that into the next stage environment, such as, say, a DIT, a development environment. And so, as uh, I mentioned in, uh, in Best Practice 4, I think here one of the keys to automation is establishing what I call an integrated tools architecture, uh, and then offering teams that set of usable tools that support their key workflows and ease the transformation, say, from where they are in their current state, such as a waterfall practice, uh, to an agile practice or even existing agile practices to scaled uh, agile. Uh, Jeff, thoughts, additional thoughts on automation? Yeah, the only thing is don't big bang automation. Yeah. Um, you wouldn't believe how many times we are engaged with an organization going through a transformation and whether it's agile or DevOps, it doesn't really matter. And they're, they're waiting for some team to, you know, release the automation to them so they can use. And this team has been working on it for months or in some cases even a year without in providing anything to them. That's not agile. We want to do this iteratively and incrementally. And just like we want to release our code in small bite-sized chunks in agile, we want to release our automation in small bite-sized chunks. The team is your customer if you're building automation. And so you should be trying to get feedback now from them as often as you're trying to get feedback from your outside customers. So don't forget about that when you automate. Mm -hmm. Excellent point. All right, practice uh, number seven, couple training with hands-on coaching. So you know what cracks me up? A lot of us spend a lot of time in, ed in education, right? We went to school, we went to college, some went to grad school, some kept going, some are still in grad school, you know, <laughs> some are lifetime students, whatever. But think about that model. You sat in a classroom and you listened, which was training, right? But then the educational experience didn't stop there. You had homework you did, you had projects you did, you went to see your professor, the professor helped you, you had study groups, you had, you know, tutors, you had all this learning that was around the training that went on in the classroom. But you look at the training we do today, the education we do out in the world, what do we do? We send people to a two-day class and then we send them home. Um, that's a very bad strategy in my opinion. What you really need to do is you need to couple training with coaching so that what you're doing is, is learning, right? Most people learn best by doing and they learn even better by doing it with people who have done it before. So just like you're relying on your professor or your grad student or your tutor, you should be relying on your, your manager, your coaches, your leadership, wh however you can get extra help. I call this immersive learning. So it's doing training that's hands-on, but wrapping around it really hands-on specific coaching about what you've learned in your environment for your particular situation. And I feel like the people that do and, and transform the best are people that go through this process of what I call immersive learning. One last point is that we've been talking about a lot of um, soft skill activities and items because those are very important in your transformation process. 
But ultimately, when you get down into your teams and figuring out what's going to work best for who, and you start talking about automation, you're talking about technical things, and you need for your coaches to be technical. Um, because Agile, I always say, is very personal. How, what's going to work best for you is different than somebody else. Every team is different. And you're going to have to sort through and figure out what is going to work best in my environment for my platforms, my code base, my database, you know, my testing process. And that's going to take some pretty detailed technical coaching. So make sure you train, you use training and coaching together. I feel that's the best way to transform. You want to comment, Mike? Yeah, just building on that, uh, certainly what, what what I'm seeing, and I know you're seeing as well, Jeff, in, in the industry, there's much more demand for more technical skill sets within organizations. Uh, uh, SDETs uh, are an example of that, software development and test. The DevOps engineers are an example uh, of that, right? And of course, as I said earlier, we're now automating and trying to automate not only testing, but we're automating the conveyor belt that moves the code as well. Yep. So these automation skills are, are very, very important. Uh, and quite often, uh, individuals and teams ask me, well, what, you know, how, how is it that I get started? I mean, uh, and, and so what I say is, look, you know, all of us are accountable for our own skill development. Can your organization help you with that? Yes. Can your manager, your leader help you with that? Yes. But don't forget, ultimately, we as individuals are responsible for making sure we continue to upskill and, and, and reskill. So I said, look, you know, just step back, you know, maybe get a mentor, maybe get a coach, uh, a peer uh, to help you uh, with a realistic assessment of where you are today in your skill sets, what you see as your current organization or some future organization you want to be a part of uh, needs, right? And then develop yourself uh, a roadmap. You know, uh, and uh, I, know, I know one of the things that uh, is a growing demand in our business is uh, what we call learning paths, where people come to us and say, you know, I'm a manual test engineer, but I'd like to become a test automator. You know, how do I get there? Uh, I'm a configuration or release engineer, and I want to move to a DevOps engineer. You know, how do I get there? I'm a project manager. I want to move to product owner. Uh, how do I get there? Right. Uh, mm -hmm. And so they can just, we, each of us can kind of develop our own roadmap on uh, the types of uh, both training as well as hands-on mentor coaching that uh, we need in order uh, to get there. Uh, I just finished reading the, uh, uh, the 2019 DevOps Institute uh, upskilling report. Uh, for those mm -hmm. that may be familiar with it, it was released, I think, about a week and a half ago from the uh, DevOps uh, Institute. And uh, clearly in there, DevOps engineers, test engineers, security engineers, automation architects, uh, infrastructure engineers, uh, CI, CI, uh, CD engineers are, are definitely among key roles that organizations are looking for. Yep, good, good point. It is our career, our own personal career. We have to invest in it and make sure everything is good. Uh, you want to cover best practice eight? Yeah, sure. This is uh, 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 the last uh, one that Jeff and I uh, chose for this particular uh, webinar. As he said, there's many, uh, but we kind of wanted to wrap up uh, on the uh, measures and uh, metrics uh, dimension. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, I see is often uh, overlooked and gets left behind in agile transformations uh, is the measurement and metrics system. So most of us, many of us have uh, evolved from uh, waterfall and we had, we had uh, specific measures uh, and metrics in place from a waterfall, waterfall perspective. Uh, many organizations that plan uh, their transformation activities forget about the fact that we also need to bring the measurement and metric system along. We've got to re-engineer it. We've got to update it. And that's critical to the success of any uh, Agile or DevOps uh, transformation. Why is that? Jeff mentioned earlier, hey, metrics drive behavior, right? And uh, of course, senior leaders uh, are the ones that usually uh, help us define and set those measures at the, at the uh, client and or uh, business level from an outcome perspective. 
so without modifying the measurement system and ensuring measures are aligned to business outcomes, and then restructuring both the individual as well as the team incentives, uh, transformations are going to surely uh, fail. And I see this over and over again where people have had to kind of uh, uh, take a step back and rethink uh, the measures in the context of Agile and DevOps. And of course, many of the contemporary uh, uh, measures that are focused on today are those that provide us early and continuous feedback, such as the static measures, uh, things like uh, the degree of code coverage or code uh, complexity, uh, looking at things like security uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, how much time does it take uh, from uh, the time that a client or a business or business partner uh, requests a change to the time that that change is delivered? Uh, how quickly can defects you know, be identified and repaired? Uh, what's the team health like? And uh, uh, does the team health, uh, does the team have a sense of continual uh, learning and uh, retrospectives and are those effective? Uh, what's your frequency of deployment, right? Uh, so what I find is the more contemporary measurement systems that we need to apply to agile and DevOps are all around faster, better and cheaper in the context of continuing to add client and uh, business value. Uh, Jeff, anything to add to that? Yep. So I always push one other thing, which is don't let management set all of your metrics to be about speed. Right? Quality and security are very important these days. You could argue more important than ever as software eats the world. And you know we want to go fast, but we have we can't allow ourselves to go so fast that we push critical bugs into production. For those that are interested, I wrote a blog on this. I'd love it if you shared it with your management. It's called Continuous Bugs, about what happens when you don't focus on quality during your delivery process. That's a mistake we're seeing people make again and again and again, and make sure your organization doesn't make it. So we are kind of curious, before we wrap up, uh, what your, um, you know, what, what, which of these best practices do you feel your organization follows? And you can click on as many of these that you feel uh, your organization does uh, do today. Uh, and let's see uh, which ones most people are doing and which ones most people aren't. I'll give you a few minutes to click on these eight different uh, best practices and we'll see where we're at. All right, so here's where we're at. Yeah, interesting. And so the top ones, engaging everyone, coupling training and coaching, and measurement look like the top ones. What do you think about that, Mike? Focus oh, on I'm culture. I'm delighted to see the measurement and metrics there because in my, my experience, we, we, I see gaps in that area. So, so for this virtual room, I think that's fabulous that uh, if, if you are allowing your measures and metrics to keep up with your Agile and DevOps transformations, uh, that's, that's excellent. And then the other is engaging everyone, which uh, uh, you know, in my in my view, is is key. As you as you spoke to Jeff, yeah, no doubt. And the one that's really lagging is paid paths, uh, which is interesting. Um, right. You know that that sounds like a webinar topic in and of itself. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's very interesting that that one is lagging so far behind. But uh, now it's good that uh, you know between about forty and fifty percent of the audience is doing most of these, which is good. That's, uh, that's good to see. So we are going to leave a, a few minutes uh, for questions. Before we do that, we want to end by you know, giving you a call to action. So what, what are your next steps and actions out of this webinar? Think a little bit about the best practices and some of the stories that Mike and I told and some of the challenges that we've seen and, and think through some of those key elements of organizational change, right? Understanding where you're at and making sure you've got a clear vision and roadmap in place and, and how you go about training and coaching and, you know, experimenting and learning, celebrating your successes. You know, think through all those things and figure out what's next for you. What, what can you take back to the organization and make successful, um, you know, going forward? 
If anyone has any questions, they can start typing them in the chat session. We're going to just run down through the chat session and answer questions. Uh, so go ahead and type those in now. Uh, let me give you a little bit of um, um, take take home information that you can use uh, for your learning journey as well. Uh, just so you're aware, we, we do have a couple of live virtual courses for those of you on, in the testing space coming up soon that you might find interesting. We have an Agile testing certification and an Agile test automation course, uh, both live virtual, which means you can do it from your desktop. Um, there's links here to click on to uh, join up for those courses if you're interested. Uh, we are giving our certified Agile leadership Cal class. It's a certif certification for Agile leadership at the Agile DevOps West conference in early June. We would love to see you in Vegas if you can make it. Uh, that class is on Sunday and Monday. It's a pre-conference uh, training class, so feel free to join us there if you want. And as always, we can bring our leadership workshops and our Agile classes into the organization as well. The last thing I want to mention before we answer some questions is I encourage you to join the TechWell Hub. It's a free community. It's a Slack community. If you point your phone at this QR code, it'll take you there right now. There's a whole bunch of different topics, including Agile and leadership and DevOps and other things. It is free. We are now holding what we call takeovers, where we invite an expert in a particular subject in Agile or DevOps or testing to spend the day on the hub, converse with members, talk about stuff. We're hoping to make the hub into something that carries on the conversations that we're having in these webinars or in training or in conferences or whatever, and make it more of an ongoing learning discussion uh, for the software community. So join the hub. It's free if you get a chance and, and check it out. Jeff, I was scanning the uh, questions there as you were uh, wrapping up. Yeah, great. Uh, and just to build on the, uh, your, the last point you made, uh, Kiana had a question. Uh, do you recommend any books or blogs for best practices uh, in uh, in agile measures and uh, and and metrics. Uh, well, first of all, the hub, as Jeff just spoke to, uh, but also as Jeff said at the beginning of the, of, uh, the presentation, uh, he actually uh, is the technical editor for something we call Agile Connections. Uh, it's a free site, and uh, you can go there and both ask questions as well as contribute uh, to Agile Connections. Uh, there's another site uh, that is uh, free. It's called Sticky Minds, and uh, you can search either one of those sites very easily and look for things on measures and metrics. I know I've written a couple articles on measures uh, and metrics there. So hopefully that will help answer that uh, question a little bit, Kiana. Any other resources from a measurement and metric uh, perspective, Jeff? I'm trying to think of a good measurement and metric book. I know you teach measurement and metric, Mike. Is there a, a good kind of reference book that's there, out there? there, yeah, there is you, one. Um, really like? I'll have to, I don't have it right at the top of my head, but I'm happy to uh, uh, send it out afterwards. Uh, yeah, we can throw it in the, the hub as well and also send it out. Um, if you can think of a good book, that would be cool. I, I can't think of one off the top of my head, but right. um, if, if you can put one in there, that would be great. Got a, I've got a couple. I'll just have to look them up. And we have a question from Dave Cresswell. Um, it's about halfway in the list. You see that? If not, I can read it to you. Yeah, go ahead and read it. I don't yeah, see. You go ahead and read them. Sure. Yeah, quite how, a, how, to, how to get customer to buy into iterative delivery without end-to-end -end testing before deployment to prod? Oh, yeah. So I don't know what kind of application you're your your building um but i'm not a big fan of going to prod without doing some end-to-end -end testing um you know i always say that you're doing end-to-end -end testing in your testing process the question is whether you're doing it or your customers are doing it mm. and in some applications you can let your customers do that because the, the cost of failure is small but in any application where the cost cost of failure is large you have to have that as part of your delivery process. So if anybody's telling you you're not doing end-to-end -end testing during a delivery process, that either means they think it's okay for the customers to do it based on the cost of failure, or they're misguided. Okay, hey, 
And Robert said, any case studies of chip design companies successfully implementing Agile? Uh, that sounds like you have one, Mike. I don't know if it's a published case study, but uh... yeah, I didn't write that one up. But uh, yeah, let me look for those. I can, I, I, I can, I don't know of any offhand, Robert. Uh, uh, but I, I would have, be happy to speak with you directly if you like, because I have been through an agile transformation at a chip design company. And we have a question: How do you customize the Scrum slash Agile training for senior leadership. What should be more emphasized and what should uh, be kept out? Mm. Well, that's a great question, actually. So we have um, executive versions of our foundational types of courses. And in general, our philosophy is um, we take out everything that goes too far into the weeds because, I mean, let's face it, your senior leadership, they're just going to glaze over and start looking at their phone as soon as, soon as you start talking bits and bytes. Uh, so it's more of a, you know, let's get them awareness of the business benefits and value of these concepts and what these concepts are. So when they hear these concepts, they know what they mean. And then most importantly to me is, What's the role of management in these concepts? And make sure they understand how to act, right? Those are the three things I think are important. Mike, can you, can you think of anything else that? Yeah, the other thing we try to do uh, as well in our presentations, and if you're gonna do, try to do this on your, on your own, uh, is, is just try to do some uh, groundwork on what the worry beads are. You know, what, what is that senior management team uh, losing sleep over, uh, you know, what's, uh, what are they getting measured on? Uh, uh, what are they accountable for? Uh, and then make sure that uh, your messaging around agile and DevOps uh, speaks to how an agile transformation or DevOps transformation uh, would help ease the pain. Alexa? Um, we had an earlier comment from Brian. Um, he said, so I understand wanting more technical, but I observe massive deficits in taking care and understanding people. Yeah, so I'm not quite sure exactly what you're, if you're, um, so when I was talking technical, I was talking about the coaches that you hire or bring in or use, internal or external, just making sure they can drill down into the needs of teams. Uh, totally understand um, if you're if you're thinking about you know the the um, the current trend that everybody needs to be a technical tester everybody needs to become more technical um, in the agile world you know we all know that more automation is happening and there is a need for um, additional automation in the process um, but I totally understand that if we're not careful we might veer away from the people aspect of business, and that's not a good thing in any, whether it's Agile DevOps or any methodology. Right. Yeah, we're always going to need those people that understand the key business practices and processes of an organization. And we have a question from Lisa. How do you recommend the progression with scaling Agile? Should teams spend time first getting solid with Scrum before trying to scale it with SAFE? <laughs> you, you hit the nail on the head. Um, you know, I think I made the tweet comment at some point. And I wrote, I think I wrote a blog on it. I'll, I'll check, but you know, if, if you're not building working software in your sprints, what are you scaling exactly, right? To me, it's all about first making sure we get our teams to be able to execute individually before we start worrying about what they can do collectively. Because if you can't make it work with one team, you're not going to make it work with 50. And so I don't have any problem with scaling models as long as you Implement them iteratively, meaning only pick and choose the things you think you need when you need them, 
But the prerequisite to all of that is that you've successfully got your teams to consistently build working code. If you haven't done that, then scaling is not going to help. In fact, it's just going to make it worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just to amplify that, uh, Lisa, I would I would just say, you know, use caution in just uh, holistically adopting any scaling framework without uh, seriously, uh, you know, customizing it and, and uh, taking the pieces that meet your context, right, to Jeff's point. Uh, uh, because just trying to lay down a scaling framework uh, without regard to your context uh, and where you are in your journey is, is, is surely going to be uh, a failing proposition. It looks like we have one yep. last, last question from Tarek. Do you have any recommendations for implementing Agile parentheses, Scrum in nearshore context? Yep. Yeah, so there's a... Um... There's a proposed series of articles on distributed Agile that's going to be written for the Agile Connection blog. I'm guessing they're going to jump into some of the aspects associated with you know, offshore slash nearshore. I'll say one thing that sticks out to me is it's really challenging, whether it's nearshore, offshore, or just a global organization, if each role is in a different location. So if you have a team made up of developers, testers, right, um, product owners, scrum masters, and every one of those roles lives in a different place, so you've outsourced testing or you've outsourced development or your product owners are on the West Coast and your developers, you're gonna struggle with Agile. You really wanna scale Agile with full teams around the world, right? So we've gotta get out, out of this idea that we're gonna we're going to outsource a role, right? We need to outsource full stack teams if you want to outsource or near shore. Otherwise, it's going to, you're going to struggle. Now, you can. I've worked on Agile projects where we had you know, people across five different locations, three or four different time zones. You can make that work, but it's going to be a lot slower than if everyone is co-located. So you're gonna give up a lot of productivity if that's the way you're structured. Mm -hmm. And I was also say it's gonna be more expensive. We, we were able to achieve that at that one financial institution I, I talked about, uh, where we first did it by role, that was a fail, but then we had distributed agile teams, uh, but it took longer and it was very expensive. Uh, fortunately at that financial institution, we had the money to spend where we actually did things like cultural exchanges. We would send people from the U.S. to India. We'd bring people from India to the U.S. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, we would have actual uh, full team uh, kickoff and planning and visioning meetings uh, to initiate, you know, a new project. Uh, but, but it was expensive. Yep. And please download the Prezo. And again, if you have any comments or questions, jump on the hub, hit us on Twitter. We've got our contact information at the end of the presentation. Don't be shy about reaching out with questions and thoughts and concerns. And you know, we're obviously always willing to help. Absolutely. Thanks. Great to work with everybody today. Thank you for being here. Yes, thank, you. thank you for your uh, engagement and your time. Much appreciated. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, and uh, just a tip to keep an eye out on your email because I think you'll be receiving a special offer in the next 24 hours on... Um, Ooh, do I get one, too? <laughs> yeah, on upcoming live virtual and pre-conference training. Thank nice. you, and have a good afternoon and a good evening. Bye-bye. All right. Take care. Thanks, Bye. all.